Well, good morning. He is risen. Amen. And what a joyous morning. What a great opportunity to come celebrate. Now, the awesome thing is, is that I know that nearly all of you, your voices are warmed up because we were singing downstairs. So we were praising God with some of the classics, some of the old hymns. We're going to do more of a modern mix up here, but it's still going to be wonderful. So let's stand. Let's praise God because he is risen indeed. Let's worship together. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin. This morning, you are our rescuer. You have saved us from sin and restored our relationship with you. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your sacrifice on the cross where your love ran red. We just pray this in your name. Amen. Comes like a flood, comes flowing. 
had become unplugged. So, all right, we're going to pick it up right there at the interlude. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all praise. He who was before there was life walked across the pages of time. He who made every living thing, behold him. He who heard humanity's cry, left his throne to wake as a child. He became like the least. 
morning and I uh, got some exciting friends that are going to join me here this morning. You guys can come on up. But one of the things our kiddos have been doing on Sunday mornings when they gather together is working to memorize different parts of God's Word. And one of the ways that we've wanted to just have that rhythm and focus be a part of our children's ministry. And so their verse that they've been working on has been John 3.16. And we've got a, a little video that they will sing along with on Sunday mornings when they're in their zone. And so we wanted to share that video and them singing with you this morning, but also thought, well, let's pick up the rest of the story, or at least the first part of the story, and have them read parts of John chapter 3 verses 1 to 15 for you. And so I'm going to come on over here and hold the microphone for them, but go right ahead, Mr. James. Our scripture, reading, our scripture reading today is from John 3, 1 through 15. Now there is a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, 
We know that you are the, a teacher come, come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows in where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how could you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has descended into heaven except who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Say it enough, Lord. You are love, 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 love. You are love, 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 love. Oh, you are love, 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 love. God, yeah. All right, with everything we have, you are love.
All right, would you say good job to them? Awesome. Well, I love, I mean, I've got three of them up there, but I love watching all of them be up there and singing God's Word, knowing where to find in God's Word those so important truths. And so um, just love what God's doing in and through our kids' ministry. So, but speaking of kids, we've got some opportunities to make some impact in the lives of children in our community. Um, and for the last several years, we have partnered with local elementary schools to provide bikes for children at the end of the year. And the deal's been, we buy the bikes, they pick the kids, and we get to deliver them. And usually that works itself out where we'll meet mom or dad or grandma and grandpa at the school, after school one day, and we'll have the kids called down to the office. And it's just a lot of fun. And so this year is no different in that regard. And so um, several of you over the last several years have given to that, and that has been just a tremendous blessing that lets us do that. And if you want to partner financially, in that this year, there are opportunities to do that as well. You can just mark whatever envelope or, or, or um, check that you'd have, just a bike giveaway. Um, but this year, we're also partnering not only with the schools, but with two other local churches in town. And so we've got a church that's just specifically taking Hooverville, and we've got another church that's going to take Summit View. And uh, we're going to own Fairview, and our goal at Fairview is six bikes. And that's one bike per grade. And then if we have the money, I'd love for us to pick up Maori. We've not ever done much with Maori, um, but I'd love to be able to reach out to the counselor at Maori and say, hey, could we do a couple bikes here? And here's what we've been able to do over the last several years. Uh, and so it's one of the ways that we have done outreach, one of the programmed ways that takes place in and through our ministries in the spring and have wanted to just have that very personal, very direct direct touch with some children and parents there in our community. Another way that we have done outreach in the month of May is also by trying to love on the teachers that are in each of those buildings. And what we've done is we've taken trays of cookies to them and have said, hey, we are in your corner. We're supporting you. We're praying for you. You're almost there. It is just about summer. You can do it. All of those really good things. Um, but I tell you, I, I, I know that we can have an, an opportunity, or at least my mind can, can downplay some of the significance that a cookie may be. Um, but I will say this. I don't know if I have personally witnessed a harder school year for those that are in the school system than this year. And there has been a depth of intensity and frequency and an even a widening of the number of just challenging moments and experiences. And being in the school on Wednesdays and Carrie having been a full-time sub for most of this year, um, we've seen it, we've experienced it, we've felt it. But I'm not sure I've talked to a single local school teacher who has not confirmed those very same things, regardless of what building they are in. And so if there's ever been a year where we want to say to our teachers, we love you and we support you and we're so grateful for you, um, that could be wind in their sails this year. And so uh, there's not much you need to do for that one. We have money set aside in the church budget that's going to buy the cookies. And so you just keep doing what you're doing and we'll buy them. But there's going to be a day in the month of May where you're going to come here and we're going to have a platform full of cookies and we're going to pray for them. And we're going to pray over them because they represent people that are going to eat them. And it's the people that matter. And it's the people that God's called us to love. It's the people that God's called us to be encouragement to. And we want to do that and do it in some tangible ways. But perhaps do it in ways that just remind them, you're not alone. And we're right here. So um, May traditionally has been a, a big outreach month for us. In a lot of ways, it's prep for Vacation Bible School that is going to be coming in the summer as well. So I want to just have those things be on your radar because those are things we can be praying for. Um, we can be praying for our teachers long before we see cookies on this platform. 
And if you want to be thinking about contributing to the bike giveaway in any way, um, there's opportunities to do that as well. So would you take this opportunity, say good morning and welcome to those around you kiddos. If you want to walk very slowly down, that would be wonderful as well. All right, well, if you could begin making your way back to your seats, and as you do, grab your Bibles. We're going to be looking at John chapter 11 together today, and as you turn there, I am I'm mindful that uh, on really any given Sunday, there is a variety of experiences and realities that we come into this room with. Um, for some of you, life's been pretty good. Uh, there's been no major complaints. It's not been that bad, and it's been pretty enjoyable. For some of you, life's been pretty hectic. Uh, it can be stressful, but you're doing all right. You're making it. You're hanging in there. Uh, for some of you, life's been pretty stressful, and you're not real sure if you can hang on any longer. Um, and then for some of you, things have been hard. Things have been tough. There's been challenges. Whether you knew they were coming, whether they surprised you, there have been challenges. You might have experienced loss. There could be health concerns that either won't go away or have somehow popped up. There are family struggles that could be and feel very real. I mean, you might be wondering if, if things are going to go down at Easter dinner in about an hour from now or not. It's just part of the reality that we come into this room with. But I'm also mindful that there's a variety of reasons why we might just find ourselves this morning in this room. For some of us, it's Sunday. And if it's Sunday, there's just really no other place that we would be than here. And it's just been part of the rhythm and character and culture of our families. For some, it's Easter Sunday. And so just what you do on Easter Sunday, and for others of you, you might really not know why you're here, um, but you are. And so regardless of where you have found yourself the last week, regardless of what realities and experiences you've brought through the door with you this morning, and regardless the reasons for why you're here, welcome. And what I would love to spend the next several minutes doing is reminding some of us, or perhaps introducing to some of you, this person who goes by the name of Jesus. And to think about who the Bible tells us this man is, what he has done. We gather this morning, has been said already, to celebrate his resurrection from the dead, the empty tomb, and our culture as Americans sets aside Good Friday and Easter Sunday as these days they show up on our calendars. But we want to think through what it is and who Jesus is. And what I would love to do in processing that with you this morning is look at a different resurrection. I want to look at the resurrection that happened right before Jesus's resurrection or the one that John records for us in Luke chapter 11. It's kind of interesting. We're not going to be able to dig into all of this, but it's in John chapter 11 in the event of Lazarus being raised from the dead that we see a lot of the things we've been considering in the book of Hebrews on display. So in the book of Hebrews, if you've been with us on Sunday mornings from the last several months, we've been working our way all uh, slowly at times and a little bit more quickly at other times through the book of Hebrews. And we've been thinking through a lot of theological truth, a lot of truths about God. We've been thinking through a lot of big words. We've been processing a lot of things. And yet the gospel accounts often take all of those theological truths or all of those big words, all those things that nerds like me really love to study and look at, and they they, they present it in story form. They present it in the, the personal narrative of who Jesus is and what he came to do and the conversations he had. It's one of those moments where the Gospels put on flesh or put these theological truths in flesh. 
in the person of Jesus. And so we're going to see a lot of those things on display. But if we just think about this particular week on the calendar, if today's Resurrection Sunday, then Friday was Good Friday, and Thursday was Monday Thursday, and Wednesday was Spy Wednesday, and last Sunday was Palm Sunday, and we have these days along in our calendar that record for us and remind us of these events that took place in the final days of Jesus' life. The raising of Lazarus from the dead is, for all intents and purposes, the event that set all of those other things into motion. Now, that's from a human perspective. I I think from God's perspective, it was all set into motion before the foundations of the world were laid. But from a human perspective, Lazarus being raised from the dead was the event that set the death of Jesus into motion. Motion, And so if we would look at John 11, even into John 12, you would see that it was Lazarus' death that brought Jesus back to the region. At this point in time, they were, the Jewish leaders were trying to find Jesus. They were trying to arrest Jesus. They had some real struggles with what Jesus had been saying. They had some real struggles with what Jesus had been doing, and he left. And he was in a different part of the area that was not as close. He was maybe about a day's journey away from Jerusalem. But Lazarus getting sick brought Jesus back. And they began to now look again for him. This event of raising Lazarus from the dead led Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, to throw a big party alongside Lazarus after he was raised from the dead. It was a birthday party, you might say. And it had a lot of attention gathered to it. And that's where Mary took the perfume and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. John records for us in chapter 12 that Judas was upset because he wanted the money that would have been used to buy the perfume or the ointment to be used elsewhere. Well, Mark tells us that it was right after that event in Judas's frustration that led him to go conspire to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. This event of raising Lazarus from the dead led to a large crowd coming to see both Jesus and Lazarus, which made the chief priests conspire with plans to kill not only Jesus, but also Lazarus. Lazarus was testifying about what Jesus had done. Those that were witnesses to this event were testifying to what Jesus had done. And so the conspiring plan of the religious rulers was, let's not just kill Lazarus, or let's not just kill Jesus, let's find Lazarus and kill him as well. And there's a bit of humorous irony there, like, let's go find the guy that was dead, that came back to life, and put him back to dead. Like, that was like their master plan. And then, oh, let's get the guy that raised the dead man back to life, and then let's kill him as well. This event led to a large crowd who had been in Jerusalem for the Passover to take palm branches and start shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey. John even specifically tells us that the crowd that had been with Jesus and Mary and Martha when Lazarus had been raised from the grave began testifying about what they had saw, and many people were placing their faith and trust in Jesus. The crowd that would have yelled, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, is even recorded as then coming back to Jesus to hear a little bit more about who this man was. And this event set into motion from a human perspective, this chain of calendar events that ultimately led to Good Friday that ultimately led to Resurrection Sunday. And it's in the resurrection of Lazarus that we see Jesus in all of his glory, in all of his deity, in all of his humanity. It's where we see in large regard a person who is yet fully God. 
It's where I think we can perhaps identify with him on a variety of levels, as Mary and Martha did, as the Jews there observing this miraculous event did, and ultimately as Lazarus did as well. And so we want to turn our focus and attention on some of those aspects through John chapter 11 together this morning. John tells us the whole purpose of his entire gospel was to record the miraculous deeds of Jesus, the signs he will call them, because John was fully convinced that by thinking about what Jesus did and how that demonstrated and authenticated that he is who he said that he was, we may find life in believing in him. And the word believe or belief or believed, whatever form or tense of the verb or the word that you want to look for, will show up in John chapter 11 more than 11 or nine times. If you go into chapter 12, it becomes even more frequent than that. John's entire point of recording this event was so that we might believe that Jesus is who he said that he is. And so to that end, I would love to pray, and we'll hop into the text and consider these things together. Would you join me? God in heaven, we do pray that you would show us this morning who Jesus is. That as John writes at the very end of this gospel account that he has recorded these things so that we might believe in Jesus and have life in him, that that would be true. And if there would be any individual in here this morning that has not trusted in Jesus for salvation, that thinking about what he claims for himself and then what he did in authenticating that claim would stir in us, that your spirit would work in us and lead us to belief in Jesus. God, for those of us here this morning that have trusted in Jesus, we pray that you would encourage us by the reminders from your word and the record and the revelation from your word regarding who Jesus is, that as we think through his plan, his deity, his humanity, and then the call that you may help us understand more of who our risen Savior is. And we pray this in his good name. Amen. Well, the first part of the story will begin at chapter 11, verse 1, and there we will see that there was some plans for Lazarus. That'll be the first part that we looked at, and I wonder if there's been moments in your life where you think something should turn out a certain way, and it doesn't turn out that way. That's really the question that's kind of at the heart of what John leads off and records here. And there's a plan for Lazarus. In fact, there's two, and both of them are good plans, but one was a better plan, and one was Jesus' plan, and the other was the sister's plans. And we'll pick up some of that as we look at the text together. Let's jump in at verse 1 with each other. Now, a certain man was ill. Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Well, the first plan that we see emerging in these verses is the plan of the sisters, It might even be the plan of Lazarus at this point, because Lazarus has not died. He's just ill, another word for sick. There's, There's something significant, like Lazarus doesn't have a cold. Something significant has befallen him, and he's ill. And the plan of the sisters was, go get Jesus. Go find Jesus. It's a good plan. Like when you think about what the author of Hebrews has told us about drawing near in our time of need to find grace and mercy and to be given that grace and mercy we need, this is an example of that. So Lazarus is sick, he's ill, and the first thing the sisters think about is we need Jesus. That's a good plan. That's a plan that demonstrates faith. 
That's a plan that understands who Jesus is. There is not a single thing wrong with the plan that the sisters had. And in fact, their faith and their understanding of who Jesus is is further demonstrated in what they each, both Mary and Martha, say to Jesus when he comes back into town. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. They knew exactly what was needed for Lazarus to recover from his illness, and exactly what they needed was a person, and it was a good plan of theirs to go find him. There was nothing wrong with their plan. It just wasn't Jesus' plan. And again, I don't know if you found yourself with moments in life where you think some things should be different, and you might wonder exactly what in the world God's doing We don't always get the benefit of an immediate response like the sisters got, like the disciples saw. Sometimes we don't have the response this side of heaven, and yet what we see at the very outset of this event is that Lazarus has gotten sick. The sisters know that what he needs is Jesus, and they go and send for him in faith that he's exactly the cure their brother needs. Their plan was good. It just wasn't his plan. And John begins to reflect on that. And if you look with me at verse 4, he records for us, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. And he knew exactly what was going on. He had this plan. His plan didn't look like the plan that Mary and Martha had drawn up. Jesus certainly could have spoken from a distance, as he did other times in even John's record of the life and ministry of Jesus. He could have just said, Lazarus, be healed, and Lazarus would have been healed. Jesus could have gone. Jesus could have told his disciples that when I say Lazarus won't die, what I mean is that he won't stay dead. But Jesus had a plan, and his plan extends to the extent that when Lazarus does pass away, that he actually tells his disciples he's glad that it happened. Because something's going to take place in their hearts. Something's going to take place in the lives of Mary and Martha that would not have taken place otherwise. If we want to try to summarize the plan of Jesus, we would see throughout all of chapter 11 that his plan included glorifying the Father, comforting the sisters, defying the religious leaders, instructing the disciples, resurrecting Lazarus, and himself and the Father receiving more glory than they would have if he had just spoken from a distance like he had at other times. It's interesting, the word that John uses to record Lazarus's sickness is just, it shows up in this translation as ill. And every time that word ill or sick or however it might show up in your translations shows up in, in John's record, that person is healed. So those people come to Jesus, they're sick, they're ill, and Jesus heals them. And it's, and it's more than likely or more than not instantaneous. And one event was even where somebody came and said, my servant is ill. And Jesus speaks from a distance and heals them. So there's good reasons based on the life and the ministry of Jesus for these sisters to go and find Jesus. But he had a different plan. And his plan included that Lazarus would actually physically die and that he would begin to put himself back into harm's way. And so as we continue, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples, they said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were seeking just now to stone you. Are you going there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? 
If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks at night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. And now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest in sleep. And then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, catch it here, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. The stakes were high for Jesus to come back into that region. We see that because it's only a couple weeks later that Jesus will be hung on a cross. They really did want to arrest him. They really did want to stone him. They ultimately crucified him. And Jesus and his plan included a delay that was purposeful so that his glory would be demonstrated in ways that it would not have been otherwise. And Jesus wanted even his closest followers to see, to understand, and to believe something about him that was either new or needed deepened. And where we begin and where we pick up in verses 17 to 27 is the deity of Jesus now on display. When Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for about four days. That day mark there, four days, shows up twice in this chapter, and it's actually an important marker of time. I believe it's why Jesus delayed, and here's why. It was believed kind of commonly amongst Jewish individuals that the soul of a person hovered for three days above that person, kind of waiting and wondering, do we get to go back in or not? And by the fourth day, it was believed that the soul had left. It would have gone to Sheol, which would have been the Old Testament way of referring to just the place after you die. And there, it would have been understood that the person was fully dead. So the resurrections that Jesus had performed earlier in his ministry were more instant than this. They were quicker after the death of the individual. It was the daughter that had died where Jesus comes almost immediately to the house and prays for the girl and resurrects her from dead. And in that moment, it could have been charged that, well, she wasn't really dead. Maybe she was unconscious. But here we're at a point in time where even the mystical belief of those in this area believing in Judaism in those ways would have been taken out of the question. Because the third day mark had evaporated. Day four is now upon us, as we'll see when we get to the end of chapter 11 as well. Lazarus has an odor to him at this point also. And we see that Jesus and his deity is on display. We're told that Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, I had a plan, and my plan was to go get you because I believed that you were the answer to what we needed. And if you had come, you would have been able to do it, and Lazarus would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. I think verse 22 is not Martha expressing an understanding that Lazarus is going to, in just a few short minutes, be resurrected, but rather expressing that regardless of what had happened, she still understood that Jesus was from the Father. So his lack of coming, his lack of healing, didn't cause Martha to waver in her belief regarding who Jesus was. She still understood him to be who he was, and that will be confirmed as we continue moving through the passage. Jesus replied in verse 23 to Martha, your brother will rise again. 
Well, we know that he means just in a few short moments he's going to rise again, but Martha's mind's not here in the present. Her mind is there in the future. And she said to him, I know that he's going to rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die physically, yet shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die spiritually or eternally. Do you believe this? And Martha said, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. As we've looked at the book of Hebrews over the last several months together, we've seen those very truths about Jesus be put front and center as the author has written, that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Son of God, and here, Martha, in the midst of a tremendously difficult moment, a moment where her prayers weren't answered as she desired for them to be answered, acknowledges that Jesus still is who he says that he is. He's still the Christ. And Jesus himself tells her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, again, I would understand that to be physically die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? As I said earlier, the word believe shows up several different times. And the question that Jesus asks Martha, do you believe this, is a question that perhaps we could understand as even directed to ourselves in the moment. This is a question that makes us confront our own inability for salvation. Our own inability to just be a little better people than we were yesterday. Perhaps it's a question that also confronts the inability of any other God or Savior. And both of those confrontations are wildly unpopular. Because I personally love to think that I'm what I need. And then the claim that Jesus is the only one that any of us actually need is going to find rebuff, not just in here personally, but elsewhere in and throughout culture, every major world religion. It's one of those statements that Jesus makes that I am the resurrection and the life. It's one of those moments and questions that he asks that we see some of the clearest language regarding who Jesus understands himself to be and then who he demonstrates himself to be. And it's one of those moments where you cannot reconcile the exclusive claims that Jesus makes about himself in any other way other than to understand them to be true or understand him to be a liar. There's no middle road at this moment. Jesus claims, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall live. There's no middle ground there. It's either Jesus is true and he's accurate and he is Christ, the son of God, or he's a liar. He's not just a good man that did some good things and taught some things that could benefit society as a whole if we took his moral lessons and applied them to our lives. Jesus himself is saying, no, I'm God. There's no middle road here. And Jesus just asks Martha, do you believe this? There is absolutely no question at this point in the story that Jesus is making claims to be God and John is shining the spotlight on the fact that he is. But the story continues from there and John next shines the spotlight on the humanity of Jesus. And when Martha had said this, That she believed, and she went, and she called her sister Mary, verse 28, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when Mary heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not come yet into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. 
when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews that had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. It's in this next section that John shines the spotlight on the humanity of Jesus. Jesus was deeply moved by the loss of his friend, by the grief that the sisters were bearing because of the loss of their brother. He was greatly troubled in spirit. We've been thinking recently in the book of Hebrews and how Jesus is able to sympathize with every one of our weaknesses and that it was fitting that the one who would lead us to glory knows what it's like to experience the grief and the hurt and the pain and the weakness and the humanity side of life. And here's one of those moments where you see Jesus, yes, he's fully God, but yes, he's fully man and experiences all those emotions, all of the trouble that comes with the loss and the grief of a loved one, even a close friend. In Jesus' divinity, as, as, as God, Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. I mean, let's not forget that he had told his disciples the day before, I'm actually glad that Lazarus died because I'm going to show you some things about myself that you would not have seen otherwise. A day before or two days before that, Jesus purposefully chose to not go. Like in his deity, in his divinity, Jesus knew exactly what's going on. In his sovereignty, he knew exactly what he was going to do. And in his humanity, he weeps. He comes right alongside those sisters and he weeps. He felt all of the grief that one feels as a loved one died. And John puts Jesus' humanity and his compassion on display and proclaims to us that Jesus cares deeply for his friends and those whom he loves. And it's Jesus' humanity and compassion that the writer of Hebrews puts on display when he commands us to draw near to the throne of grace. And the author of Hebrews has made the point, Jesus knows. He knows what it feels like. He's walked that road. Draw near. John shines the spotlight in narrative fashion on those same truths. And in the moments where we don't really understand what's going on, we don't understand why our prayers weren't answered, we don't understand whatever it might be that we don't understand, we're invited to draw near and find the grace and mercy that comes from the one who does understand both from the divine side but also from the human side. The last part in John 11 is where we see the power and the call of Jesus. And in verse 38, John continues to record for us that Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. If you have a King James Version, I think it says, he stinketh. For he's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, I, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew you always heard me hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. 
And the man who died came out. His hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. In some ways, returning to the plan of Jesus, you see Jesus pray for the benefit of those listening. He prays for the purpose of their belief, and he commands Lazarus to come out, and he does. And the resurrection of Lazarus powerfully demonstrated that Jesus was God, powerfully demonstrated that he was the resurrection and the life, and that he cares, it visibly and vividly revealed that he cares for people in ways that we cannot begin to get our minds fully wrapped around. And that he cares even when his plans may look different than our plans. The resurrection of Lazarus also serves as an illustration of what salvation is. And writers in both the Old Testament and the New Testament speak of those that have not been born again as being dead in their sin. And the process of becoming born again, as our kids just read this morning when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, that you must be born again. They use the language of the dead becoming alive to speak of that. And Lazarus serves as an illustration of what salvation is. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies physically, yet shall live spiritually. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And perhaps then the question for us this morning is the question Jesus posed to Martha. Do you believe this? If you're here this morning and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, spiritually, you're Lazarus. You're in the grave. You're wrapped in all the clothes that would have been appropriate for burial. You stinketh. You're dead in your sins. You're perhaps living physically, but in your unbelief, spiritually you're dead. Perhaps that's the bad news of the gospel. The sharp cut that the Bible continually just returns back to as it relates and recounts the reality of our sin and that the wages of our sin is death. The bad news is that, but it is so quickly balanced and overtaken by the good news that the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That, as our kids said earlier this morning, that for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The invitation and the question this morning is, do you believe? There's no magic words that you say to become a Christian. There's an acknowledgement that Jesus is who he says that he is, that he is who the Bible reveals him to be, and that we desperately need him. We need him in the moments where life doesn't make sense. But we need him first and foremost because we're dead and lost in our sin. And it was the love of the Father that sent the Son to bear that cross on Good Friday, to be buried in the grave. But he did not stay dead. He rose from the grave giving a final yes and amen that all of what he said was true and left for you and I to place our faith and trust in. I'd love to pray with you as the band comes up to lead us. Would you join me? God in heaven, 
We thank you for your plan. We see it on display in what Jesus did and what Jesus said in the person of Lazarus, in the lives of Mary and Martha. We see it also on display in what it was that you did in sending Jesus. That you loved us so much that you sent your one and only son. And that whoever believes in him will not die but have everlasting life. And so God, we want to, in reflection here this morning, cast our mind to Calvary. Where Jesus took the penalty of our sin and he paid for it. But more than that, we want to think through and about who Jesus is claimed that he was and what he has promised to do, that there is eternal life found in him and him alone, and that he has promised to come back for his own, and we will forever spend our eternity with him. We thank you that that tomb is empty both Lazarus' tomb and Jesus' tomb. We think of and on and sing to our risen Lord and Savior now. We pray this in his good name. Amen. Would you stand as they lead us in closing?
forever, Lord, we will sing your praise. We sing it today. We will sing it forever in your presence, in your glory, when we are caught up with you. And Lord, we just uh, thank you that you have called us out of sin and into your life. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, he is risen. Yes. Amen. Have a wonderful Easter day, and we hope to see you again next week. Thanks again for joining us, and be sure to check us out on the World Wide Web.